Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, a free safe space for people to share and learn from others' experiences with mental health and addictions. I'm Todd Runnebaum, suicide attempt survivor and a recovering substance abuser. It's summertime and life is crazy. There's a lot going on in my life right now, including moving to a new city uh, and, well, lots of other stuff. So because of that, I'm going to take a little bit of time off. But don't worry, there's still great content, including this episode. Over the next coming weeks, I will be featuring some of my friends' podcasts that I think you should check out. And also some past episodes that maybe you haven't listened to yet or they didn't get the love they deserved at the time. You know, not everyone's gone through and listened to every episode, so uh, they may not be new to me, but they could be new to you. So please sit back and enjoy past episodes and other great episodes from other great podcasters. I will be returning with all new episodes August 31st, and be prepared. There's going to be some amazing guests with amazing stories. Until then, keep listening and enjoy. I'm actually um, a private detective here in Australia and I investigate finances and I was working for a gentleman that was, um, he he had cancer. Uh, I didn't know how bad it was. Uh, We got to know each other quite, quite quickly over the last, you know, six weeks I was working with him and he was, um, he was dying and, and he was dying quickly. And we started talking about death and the afterlife and, and, and just all things surrounding death, you know, and I said to him, why don't you do a eulogy? You know, do your own video, put a eulogy out there, and instead of someone else fucking talking about you, do it yourself. And he goes, no. He said, I've been to funerals where mates and the family, they just don't play them, or they watch them first and they go, oh, it's a bit cringeworthy. Now, honestly, as a joke, and it was only a joke, I said to the guy, I said, look, I could crash your funeral for you. (laughs) And lo and behold, he took me up in the offer, and it's exactly what I did. I crashed his funeral for him. It's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> and then that turned into word of mouth, other people wanting you to do stuff for them. Oh, insane. Insane. Yeah, word of mouth just went went nuts. And then it was like um, other doors started opening. So I ended up um, getting a call from a palliative care nurse that a gentleman wanted to see me. Uh, I went and saw this guy and he had some items at his home that he needed removed before his sons find it. And um, what I didn't realize is that this guy had actually had a fall at home. And when he was taken up by ambulance to the hospital, they said, you'll never return home again. So everything that was there was like his TV was on, the lights were on. He he just had a fall and gone. I mean, his half cup of tea was still there. So he was never going to return home. And he panicked and he was so upset. And when he got word of what I did through this palliative care nurse, and, and I met the gentleman, he said, look, he said, I've, I've got a room at home that I need cleaned out. And I, I really do, I'm really embarrassed about it. And, and, and it was quite emotional for him. And I said, look, to him, no problem. I said, you tell me what you want removed, I'll go and do it. You know, and he says, oh, in this room, there's a key under the kitchen sink. You go into the room, it's a bit of a sex dungeon. <laughs> And I, uh, yeah, yeah, and it was, he was 88 years of age, this guy. Lord. And seriously, I'm talking a sex dungeon that was done in such a beautiful way. It didn't look like a dungeon. It was dark and seedy. It was done really, really professionally, really nice. Uh, And I gathered all the items and I brought them back to the farm and I incinerated them. I showed him all the video clips that I, what I'd done for him. And he was elated. He was so happy and so I, I guess he could go without the fear of his sons finding out what he was into. And that opened other doors. So, yeah, it just kept rolling. I guess in a way this is, yeah, mental health related. Because, you know, a little <laughs> peace of mind before you go. It's like you're already dying. you got enough shit going on in your mind that you're dying. And then, you know, that peace of mind that you're not going to. Exactly. I mean, how many? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, when you think about the mental health side of it, I mean, we all have secrets. Every person on this planet has got a secret. A skeleton in the closet, so to speak. And we'd, we'd actually, <laughs> we'd be petrified if someone found out, you know, or, or not someone, but the wrong someone. Right. Right. And there's a lot of bloody vultures in the families, right? And there's even vultures that'll use that stuff against you. So, you know, in a way, he just needed to have a clearance. And, and so have a lot of people since just to get rid of certain items, even 
you know, elderly ladies have said, look, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed. I've got a couple of sex toys. Can you go and remove them? Yeah, not a problem. It's no big deal to me. I mean, it's not my toys. It's not my family. It's not my life. I'm just doing a job, and that's what I do. Huh. Do you think he was he was having appropriate sex? Like, he wasn't doing anything illegal or anything. He was just – he just had this – Oh no! Kink. It was it was set up very very nicely. He, he was pretty yeah. He was pretty cool because I mean, look, I do investigate my clients each time I get a client. I have a look into their background. I you know, and there's a few things I can do, and I'll go into the internet searches and things like that. And there was nothing inappropriate. This bloke did. He just lived a life that he wanted to live. He he lost his wife. I don't know when he was five, four, 40 or fifty or something, and you know, been alone for thirty years, and and just got into this thing. And hey. Why not? Yeah, yeah. As long as you're not hurting anyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's. But I, mm. at the same time, I understand why he would not want his kids to find it. But no, oh, yeah. of course, yeah, absolutely. When I think of kids, I think of like twenty year olds. But he was eighty eight, so his kids were probably like sixty five. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean they're in late forties, early fifties, you know, whatever they were. But then he's got grandchildren, and then he's got you know, and it was just it would have been very embarrassing, you know. Yeah, that's quite the service you provide, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I call them home sweeps now because I've done quite a few. So I just, uh, yeah, so I do home sweeps. I do, uh, I go to viewings where I'll view the body and I'll place items in with the, in the casket with the body, you know. And most people want their mobile phone when they're dead. I don't know why. They think they're going to, uh, I don't know, wake up six foot under. I don't know. But they want their mobile phones. Yeah, I mean, uh and then other people want me to pin prick them like a uh, pin cushion to make sure they are dead because they're petrified about being cremated or buried alive. Oh, oh well, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, whatever they want, they get. I'm scared of spiders, so I guess whatever. We're all scared of something. <laughs> <laughs> of course we are. Uh, have you have you had to crash any other weddings or or not weddings? Crash other funerals for people? Oh, I've crashed quite a few now. Yeah, so it's been. Um, it's just rolled. I mean, the, the, the story got out and then, you know, once it's in the media, people started to want to hire me just for fun, you know, <laughs> and, and it became a bit of a gimmick. But um, Graham, my first client, he actually set the price of $10,000 a funeral. And I'm glad he did because it stopped other people just using my service for a bit of a revenge or, or whatever there was. So legitimate people came forward, which was great, hmm. you know. And at the same time, I actually – Manipulated the price too, from two thousand to ten thousand dollars, depending on where I go and everything else, and what's what's involved, you know. Um, but again, they don't need the money where they're going, and I never get a complaint. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Have you ever had family come up to you and be like, "What the fuck?" Like, we found this receipt, I, and like, you, how much did my dad pay you to do this? <laughs> no, you know, I've never had a um, a confrontation about the actual. Um, the engagement of my services. I mean, obviously, there's people that are upset that I've just interrupted a funeral service, but at the same time, what I do is I get the crowd on my side as quick as I can. And I mean, by way of doing that, I'll, I'll go into a funeral and I'll go, excuse me, my name's Bill O'Guy, I'm the coffin confessor. This is your loved one laying in the coffin. They've left something unsaid. You want to hear what it is? Great. If you don't, Fuck off, uh, okay? Because yeah. your loved one's got something to say. And then half the crowd will go, oh, fuck, what did you, oh, I wonder what it is, you know, and they want to know. <laughs> yeah. So the other half saying, oh, sit down and shut up, they're getting put down by the other half going, no, we want to hear what he says, you know, and it's, it's These are his yeah, dying so wishes. the crowd's the most important. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, and it's them. It's not me talking. I'm just lending my voice. That's all I'm doing. Don't shoot the messenger. Or if you do, you've got to make sure you kill me. <laughs> <laughs> What's the one where there was an affair or something? And uh, you crashed the funeral. Ah, oh, there's a, look. There's yeah. <laughs> look, infidelity seems to be the main, uh, I guess, thing to get pe people off their chest. You know, they they want to expose what they've done. They don't want to take it with them. They they want to tell their loved one, no, you know what? Yeah, I did fuck around. And not only that, I know you did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And sometimes I'm reading these letters, and I'm thinking to myself. Oh, fuck, I've got to let this, oh, you know, it's just going to explode. But, yeah, look, infidelity is quite big. I mean, I did have to, um, a little lady, uh, I, I met a lady who was a beautiful lady. Her husband was an absolute fuckwit. Um, he was 
uh, narcissistic prick. Um, and I let him know that uh, his kids weren't his. They're actually his brothers. Um, at the funeral. It didn't go down well for him. At the funeral. Didn't go well down for him. But, you know, at the same time, at least she cleared the air with her children before that was done. So at least the kids knew and everything, you know. So there was no big surprise for the kids. It wasn't an awkward thing, but it made it very awkward for him. And everybody that knew that 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 family, they knew he was a prick. And they loved to see him out, you know, so it didn't matter, right. you know. So, and I enjoyed doing that, those type of things. It was a bit like, um, you know, one gentleman, he, he didn't want to, he, he did not want a funeral, uh, a religious funeral, right? That was his whole thing. I don't want a religious funeral. Mum and dad are going to have a religious funeral. I do not want one. All his friends knew that he wasn't religious. All his friends knew that he didn't step foot in the church. He hated God, hated all this thing, and that was his beliefs. And, and you know, lo and behold, what happened? His mum and dad organised a bloody religious funeral. You know, so I have to go in there and say, look, this is being closed down. It's not going to happen. He doesn't want a religious funeral. He just wants to be cremated. And, and they go, no, no, he's being buried. No, he's being cremated. That's what he wants. This is his wishes. Here's the contract. Here's the video. This is what's going to happen. Now, all his mates stood up and cheered. They were like, yeah, fucking oath. Hmm. Good. About time someone stood up. And I'm like, why didn't you all fucking stand up? Yeah. Really. Yeah, and then I just leave. So, you know, it, it seems funerals, we seem to be there and we're respecting the living, not the actual dead. And right. that's got to change. You've got to respect the dead and what they want. Fuck everyone else. I suppose doing funerals, it's hard to get a tip afterwards, though, because, you know, they're dead. I get paid up front. I don't need to test <laughs> Okay. Uh, there was one I, I heard you do on um, the Andrew Gold. On the Edge with Andrew Gold, by the way, is an amazing podcast. This is where I first uh, heard of, of Bill. But do you prefer Bill? Is that okay? Or, yeah, well, Bill's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and Andrew was great. You know, I've got to know Andrew quite well and a bit of a pen, pen pal with him. It's, it's good. Yeah, same. yeah, I like Andrew. Yeah, yeah, he's a good good bloke, as they say. Um. The one story you were telling on there was the the guy was in bed dying basically, and he could see his best mate popping in trying to get. get yeah, that with was his my wife. first funeral. Yeah, my first crash. That, that was Graham. Yeah, oh. um, he was the one that was dying, and and he was in um he was in a state. Um, if you've ever been with somebody that's on their deathbed, they're very weak. They don't they can't speak much. They have limited time to talk. They fall asleep a lot. Um, they cry, they're upset, um, they don't want to die, um, and then they do want to die because the pain's horrific. Yeah. Um, this guy couldn't defend his wife from his best mate who was leeching and coming into the house and, and basically all over his wife. His wife didn't want anything to do with him, but they couldn't get rid of him. And I said to him, look, you know, if you can allow me to set a couple of cameras up to prove that this is going on, I'll definitely out him at the funeral, not a problem. So I did that and uh, I found out exactly what he was doing and what he was up to. And he was just a, he, he wasn't a mate. He was just a thing. And um, it ended up, <laughs> I said to Graham, I said, well, how about when your best mate's doing the eulogy, how about I stand up and interrupt it? And he goes, yeah, yeah, what would you say? I'd say, oh, sit down, shut up or fuck off. Graham in the coffin's got something to say. You know, and he goes, yeah, yeah, that sounds really good. Let's do that, you know. <laughs> and so Graham started getting a bit of life about him, you know, and we started writing out and planning what was going on. And it was one of the most, I, I don't know, it, it was a bit magical to see a bit of life come back into Graham because he, he hadn't, he had something to do, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it really, yeah, and, and it excited him. Even though he wasn't going to be there, he said he was going to be there, you know, in his own way. And it was pretty cool. Yeah, so I, I enjoyed doing that one. So you were a private investigator and he hired you to, to check out his best mate. And then by doing... No, oh. no, I was I was working prior to that for Graham oh, I see. Uh, okay. in a financial capacity, yeah. Oh, okay. And we just got to talking and knowing and each other. And uh, and I've got to say, every client I've met, um, even up until the other day, I meet these people and I get to know their secrets, their desires, their fantasies, everything about them in such a short time. And I'm so humbled but blessed to, to be able to hold those secrets for those people. And some of them, they haven't even told their, their wives or families or, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, and they're letting them out to me. And I'm like, fuck, you know, you really want me to say that at the funeral? And they're like, 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, how are you going to feel? Well, I'm dead. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know? have, you, have you ever kind of grown attached to some of your clients and then, like, you know they're they're expiring, so it's is that a bit of a mind fuck for you? That No, uh, not really, because I, I, I attach to the, the thought that I'm preparing them for their journey and I'm doing a job for them and I'm happy to do that. And every client I've had has been like, it's good to know something's actually going to get done that, and that's the belief and that's what I entrust and, and tell them, you know, is that whatever you say, what you want done will be done. Okay, and, and a lot of people go, well, why can't they get a family member or a friend to do that? Because the fucking family member or friend won't do it. You know, it, it's not easy to stand up at a funeral and tell everyone to fuck off or, <laughs> you know, or, or even if it's a loving message. And, and, I mean, I've done a lot of funerals where they're good, bad, funny and sad. So there's a whole range of, of funerals and it's not all bad or revenge. I mean, some of them are just... You know, I, even I get choked up at reading some of the letters. You know, you'll read them and you'll go, you know, there was one particular lady, she's, uh, in her letter, she screams, I don't want to die. I didn't want to die. I don't, it's not the fear of dying. It's the fear of losing you, losing my husband, my, my, my children, and, and not being able to feed them and clothe them and be with them. And, and it's heartbreaking because you're listening to this emotion. And then everybody in the audience is like, the same thing. They're, they're emotional, but they're actually hearing it from her, even though it's my voice. And, and it's it's really cool because you haven't got just a priest standing up on stage going, oh, we've got to remember this lady. And, and the priest may not even fucking know her. I've never met her. I know. I don't, I don't get that. I don't get it either. But anyway, so I like – I enjoy doing what I do, and I do get close to them to a point. But I've made sure that in my life, I, I'm not close to anyone anyway. You know, only my wife and my children, that's it. You know, I, that's, that's just the way I am. Hmm. Is that uh, a, a choice that you made or like a conscious choice or, or is that kind of like a trauma-based uh, look, it, thing? You know, if we're, yeah, I think it's, it's more of a trauma-based thing that I've adapted uh, since the trauma and I don't carry other people's baggage. I don't. Um, I never have a co-accused. I always make sure I do things on my own. Um, I don't have a friend in the world where I can go and have a beer or a coffee with. I, I do that by choice because I, I just know that the people that are closest to you are the ones that hurt you the most. Um, and it's a it's a true fact for me. I've seen it. I've seen it through all the funerals I do. And for me, you know, from the age of seven to, to the age of fifteen, you know, I was I was abused, molested, raped bullied, bashed, and this was by my grandfather and then teachers at a school. And, and, and this is another thing that really blows my mind is that as you get older and you, you start wondering and thinking and learning, um, you know, those four men that abused, bashed me and, and did what they did to me as a child, they were all married. They were married men with children. Mm. They had their own lives. They, not one gay man had ever hurt me, not one. And yet I used to think that the gays were the ones that were, were bad and I'd go poof to bashing and all that. They never did anything to me. It was married heterosexual bullshit that, that attacked me. And I'm like, yeah, you know, so that's something I have to live with for the rest of my life is knowing that I did hurt certain people for no other reason than society making me think that, you know, poofs and gays and all that, they're, they're pedophiles. And they weren't. And you, you actually went out and beat up some homosexual people oh i used to do it all the time as a, as a kid yeah as, you know 16 17 18 year old yeah mm, for sure mm. for sure i got that's how i was getting my revenge right you know and i didn't know those perpetrators on me i knew my grandfather was married with kids and that but i didn't know the other three teachers were you know ha had families or anything i you know as far as i know we we're at school and then half the kids were saying oh he's a poof or he's gay and and i'd just seek my revenge on other poofs and gays and it wasn't it was wrong so wrong. Um, maybe maybe describe your your childhood. <laughs> my childhood, <laughs> <laughs> your younger years, mate. mate uh, I, I got to say, look, from the age of um, it was my eighth birthday the next morning, and and the night before my eighth birthday, my grandfather uh, um, sexually, physically, and mentally abused me in a way that was um, horrendous. But in the morning, I woke up to him giving me a brand new bike. Um, <laughs> 
and then that went on for years, you know, and uh, it was it was horrific. And uh, I'd be telling my mum, she'd she'd you know basically hit me with a strap or a wooden spoon for lying or talking bad about my grandfather, and and it was it was terrible. I couldn't tell anybody. There was no one I could tell. So I, I sort of always went into this little room in my own world. And when anything happened, I'd just escape to there and I'd become like a mute. <laughs> Whatever happened to me, I, I could see myself, but I couldn't feel anything. And it, that I always had that room. And um, to this day, I can still go there. I mean, it's not a place that I, I like to visit anymore, but it's still there. Um, you know, I, I won a scholarship to a school, a prestigious school in Australia. Um, it was there that I tried to explain to them what had been happening at home. What I didn't realise is that I was put into a system that was a, a pedophile's playground. They knew what was happening. They knew we had no money. They knew, you know, I was living in government housing. They knew I was a child that had no, no money, no power, no ability to, you know, help myself or anybody to help me. So I became a toy for the teachers. Damn. So they knew you were vul mm. vulnerable. You, uh, man, I'm fucking. It's nauseating hearing this shit no oh, it's gutting yeah it's gutting because i mean i look at my grandchildren today and i think to myself i'd die if that i i would kill i would kill them in a heartbeat if they ever did that to my children what happened to me i mean to use um their power and 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 i was always hungry as a kid and, and i, I got to be honest with you I, I was never an alcoholic a drug addict or anything like that. i was hungry I broke into more houses than I could imagine, right? or you could imagine. But at the same time, I only went to the fridge. <laughs> I stole food. People would be coming home going, fucking someone's been in the house. Or would they steal the spaghetti bolognese? <laughs> <laughs> Who ate my sandwich? <laughs> yeah. But that would be me because that's what I do. I was so fucking hungry. And at school, one of the ways one of the perpetrators, one of the teachers, He'd go through the lockers of the other boys and, and bags and he'd steal stuff from all the kids. He'd bring it into his office and he'd say to me, now, if you tell anybody what I'm doing to you, I'm going to tell him that you're the thief of the school and you're the one stealing all this stuff. And, and it hurt me so much. And it, it, it was a manipulation that I couldn't get away from because kids knew I was poor. Kids knew I was on a scholarship. Kids knew I didn't have lunch money. What the fuck's lunch money? I never had that. And so when they started seeing me eat, and if the teacher was to say, look, he just stole your lunch from the bag, and oh, it, it was just horrific. You know, so they used all types of coercion, and yeah, it was terrible. And this is the teacher you went to to talk about your grandpa abusing you, and then he went and did this shit. Yeah, exactly. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. Yeah, he... um. It, it started off with, oh, I'm going to help you. This is how I'm going to help you. And then all of a sudden it was um, stripped down. Tell me what your grandfather does to you and show me what you do to him on me. You know, and I was like, fuck, you're kidding me. Like, you know, I'm a kid. I was fuck. 13, 14 years old, you know. Well, no wonder you have trust issues. Like, you're told as a, <laughs> well, you're told as a kid if someone's doing shit to you, tell an adult, tell a teacher, tell someone. And that's exactly. exactly what you did. Yeah. And then all it did was get you yeah. more and more and more. So, yeah, so three, exactly three, right. uh, yeah. there was three teachers that? Three teachers. One of the teachers wasn't a sexual abuser. He was, um, he hated me from the start because I was on a scholarship. Uh, he, um, he nicknamed me a charity case and that I wasn't worth teaching and that uh, because the other kids' parents pay for the privilege of coming to the school like this, he will not teach me. Um, so he ended up picking me up by the ears and hanging me on a hook at school like a port rack, and he ripped my ears till they bled. He kicked me, dragged me along the carpet. He did everything to embarrass, humiliate, and, and really abuse me in a way that I didn't see a difference between the sexual abuse and that abuse. But what I did find is that later on in life, um, and not long after I, I left, I ran away from both home and school, and lived on the streets. And I think that punishment, that abuse, no one could hurt me again. I couldn't, I, I couldn't even cry. Hmm. There, everything had been ripped out of me. I, I had no emotion. I had no emotion for people. I didn't give a fuck about people. You know, and if they wanted to hurt me, well, give it a go because I'm now on the streets and I'm learning fast and hard how to, how to look after myself. And it became a, a world that 
I was thrown into, and people say, oh, you were just, you, you just went that way. I didn't just go that way. I was forced that way. I had no choice. You know, that, that's exactly, you know, how it was for me. And, and not only did I lose my childhood, but I, I lost any thought of even religion. I mean, that was ripped away from me. Uh, you know, because at the time, and even like people say to me, oh, how, how do you find God and all that? You're an atheist. And, and I'm not religious. I, I, I really aren't. And the reason I'm not religious is because the school and the Anglican church that owns the school, they taught me from a very young age that, uh, and, and this sounds really awful, but at the same time, it's something that I, I was, I've lived with my whole life until I found something better and a higher being and everything else. So in my own life, as a child, I was told by the school, but not in direct terms, but they, they said, look, you know, our God raped a girl named Mary who gave birth to a bastard son named Jesus who died for your sins. And repent means repeat. And I'm like, what the fuck? What are you talking about? And they go, well, if our God can do it, we can do it. Shut up and sit down. And I'll be like, I don't get it. I, I, I couldn't get my head around why so many people were into religion then. And it pissed me off and I, I really hated it. <laughs> and I'd start to think, is repent repeat? Is it really? Do they go to church every Sunday and they repent, but they go do the whole fucking thing again for another seven days? Uh, was So was the, the posh school you went to, was that like a, a religious school too? Yeah, yeah. It was, so it was an Anglican boys school. Uh, very posh. Very uh, even today, it's it's a very high monetary school to go to to attend. Um, I've been going through the the battle with them for over thirty years, and it's only just I only just got a letter the other day saying that um, you know they're going to refute the claims that I put forward, even though they may have made an offer in the past. Uh, I say may. <laughs> There's been a few offers in the in the past, um, so. Let's see where it goes. I mean, at this stage, it, it, they've turned it a whole thing around and made it about money. And I've never made it about money. I wanted a fucking apology. I wanted the acceptance. I wanted something to happen to move on so it would never happen again. And they wouldn't do that. So I started a Facebook page called Lost Boy of TSS. And that Facebook page started gaining a lot of attention. And then all of a sudden, 133 other students came forward. And started speaking to me about their personal abuse and what was going on there. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I'm glad I wasn't the only one then. Well. Oh, I'm not happy about not <laughs> right, being the only right, one. Right, right, I know what you but mean. But I'm glad yeah. I wasn't the only one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like, if, if three teachers were doing this, two mm -hmm. of them sexually, guaranteed you weren't the only kid this is happening to. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing is happening around, there's a local city here. It's uh, some kind of culty, weird Catholic church and like four people mm. came out uh, last week and within the last week it's like in yeah 150 people or something and it's of course I mean it's an it's an epidemic it's vile and it's being covered up by the higher powers which pisses me off the most you know why not expose them we have a prime minister in Australia that put a block on ever knowing what was going on within certain you know realms of the government and certain people and even a prime minister they've accused of being a pedophile and they will not release the documents for 99 years. What the fuck? I don't get it. But the one thing I've learned, and this is like a lot of people said to me earlier on, they said, you're fucking with the church. They're going to get you. The alumni, they're going to get you. They're very powerful. Mm. Well, you know what's more powerful? Someone that doesn't give a fuck and someone that holds their secrets that's more powerful. The truth is powerful. Right? And I hold some of their oh yeah. And I hold some of their secrets, some of the alumni boys' secrets. And they don't want that. <laughs> those fucking boys don't want that coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's more powerful. <laughs> yeah. Who holds the biggest secret? And how many? You'll be crashing their funerals and telling stories for free. I, I will. <laughs> I'll do that for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you well, I get on Andrew Gold's podcast there i had to laugh because you were talking about uh, uh how you always get your 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 comeuppance and revenge <laughs> and it was some, yeah. some bullies beat you yeah. up when you were a kid and then it was like 20 years later you knocked on the guy's house and punched him in the face <laughs> yeah i did yeah for sure 
<laughs> sure. oh. Everyone that ever hurt me. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I've I've done the done the rounds on. Uh, look, I I'll be very honest with you. Um, uh, seven seven days ago, mm-hmm. I repaid my last debt that I know of, and I got in touch with this um this kid. Or oh, I thought he was a kid. He's in his twenties, you know. And I said to him, I said, oh, are you the um, son of so-and-so? And he goes, yeah, I am. Did you know him? I said, yeah, I knew your dad quite well. And he goes, wow. He said, can you tell me about him? And I said, oh, where is he? I've been trying to look for him. And he says, oh, he died nine years ago of brain cancer. And I went, oh, mate, you're not going to like this, but I stole $5,000 off your dad when I was a kid. And he said, what? I said, yeah, I did. I said, I stole $5,000 off him as a kid. And I said, I, I need to give that $5,000 back to him and, and you're, his, you're his son. And he goes, yeah, yeah. I uh, got to know him and I said to him, look, can you please give me a bank account that I can put the money into? So he gave his mum and his mum's account and I put the money into the account. And that was the last thing I had to do as far as giving back and, and repaying. But prior to that, there was a guy that um, he actually beat me up on the way to school. <laughs> And he used to get his joys out of doing that. And as he, as he became a teenager, he became pretty synonymous of being a bully and a prick and everything else. And, and it was I think I was 30. And, uh, yeah, I knocked on his door. And I said, uh, I said, Scotty. And he goes, yeah, yeah, do I know you? You look familiar. I went, whack. I said, now, <laughs> now we're going to talk. I said, I was that kid that used to ride past your house all the time. You'd run out and beat me up for going to school. You remember? Oh, no, no, I don't remember. It wasn't me. It was my neighbour. I said, it wasn't your fucking neighbour. It was you, you know. <laughs> so then he sat and he cried and he said he was sorry and he was a religious person. He didn't mean to do that and his childhood wasn't good either. And, and I said to him, you know what? I said, I get it. But I had to do what I have to do because that's just me and I, I, that's how I'm getting my, yeah, come on. And so I don't call it revenge. I just call it karma because I'm karma. <laughs> You're repenting. Yeah, every Sunday. <laughs> and then repeating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're repeating your abusers. Um, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health is supported by Co-op. I've been a member of my local co-op, Sherwood Co-op, for about 20 years. If you live in Western Canada, especially the prairies, or spend any time here, you've probably fueled up or bought groceries at a co-op. You might even have a co-op number, or two, or three, You know if you know. But Co-op is not just a gas bar or grocery store. Although Co-op is those things too, it's a different kind of business. Co-op members are owners and success is shared with everyone. Your Co-op doesn't benefit one person or one corporation. Your Co-op was built for everyone. Your Co-op was built for your community. Learn more about Co-op and find a location near you at co-op.crs. One thing I've learned through my experience with mental health and addictions is you never know what you need to hear until you hear it. Make sure to rate and review on Apple and to tell as many people as you can about the podcast so others can hear something they need to hear from one of my guests. After all, this is a free mental health service, which is a rare thing. So why not share with as many people as you can? Tell me a bit about your dad. This sounds interesting. Uh, My old man was a... um... Yeah, he was a he was a gangster in Australia. He wasn't a uh, he wasn't a nice bloke. He came over from Ireland with his family. Um, he came over when he was seventeen or something from Ireland. Uh, moved to Melbourne, Broadmeadows. Met my mum. Uh, she was English. The Irish and the English hated each other then. They hated each other now. Um, they got together. The families didn't like each other. He fell into boxing. He was very good at boxing. Um, he fought some of the hardest people in, in Australia boxing, and uh, he did very well for himself. Uh, but then he fell into the the bad side, you know. The, the and I don't mean drugs, drink, or anything like that. It was all about money for him. It was about uh, standover man and collecting money. Uh. So he used to, uh, yeah, just go and bash people for money, and then it got. Uh, he worked in a place down in Sydney called, we had a place called King's Cross, which was notorious for, you know, gangsters and all that. My old man used to look after some of the most prominent people, nightclub owners. And one of the nightclub owners who owned the Pink Pussycat and another club uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember the name, but uh, uh, Frank Sinatra used to come over to Australia and 
you know, he was a good friend of this this guy who owned the club. And my old man used to, you know, travel with them, make sure they're okay. And he took out some really bad people, but uh, he was no saint. He he was a he was a terrible man himself. He did some bad shit. So yeah, in and out of jail his his whole life as well. So, but um, notorious as yeah. So was was he in your life very much then as a kid? No, I, I look. He left when I was about three or four. Oh, okay. Uh, I do believe though, he, he came into my life now and then. Like he would have just he, he would. I I do know that he came to a soccer game once once and watched me. Uh, he stood at a school gate once and saw me, um, you know, things like that. The, you know, it was never like, I don't think he wanted to come back into my life after what he'd been through and what he'd been doing. Mm. I think uh, there was a lot of people after him as well. Um, and you see these shows uh, like Underbelly and, and, and shows about the, the, the criminal world and, and the gangsters and, and that. And... Um, my old man was in the background doing all the stuff that these people were taking uh, credit for, right. you know. Yeah. And if there was anybody that uh, people say to me, oh, you know, your old man, he was nicknamed the Irishman. He was Irish and he was nicknamed the Irishman. So if there was any problems, you got the Irishman and he'd deal with it. Now, people used to say um, the Cray brothers in England you know, uh, were notorious. And they'd say, your, your old man was the Cray brothers put together. He was that bad, you know. And I'd go, well, you know, I'm, I'm probably glad I didn't didn't really get to know him, you know. And, and a lot of people are happy he's dead. And I, I guess, yeah, well, if it's that bad, you know, he, he had his chance, his time, and, you know, it's gone. Uh, so you don't think your life would have been better with your dad in it? <laughs> it would have been just as shitty, probably. No, I'd probably become the other side. I, instead of what I became yeah. uh, and how I used everything to better myself, I'd probably use it against everybody. I'd probably be dead. Right, right. Uh, so you, you talked about your grandpa. and it, Like, you lived with your grandpa, was it? Like, you and your mom and your grandpa and your grandma and... Yeah, oh, yeah, we didn't have a choice back then in the 70s, early 80s. I mean, we all lived together in the one house. There was no food, no money. You know, we rented. I, th- I counted, I think I've lived in 37 houses in five or six years when I was a kid. We get we just kept getting kicked out of houses because we couldn't pay the rent. Um, and there was eight of us living in the house, you know. There was aunties, uncles, you know, grandparents, you know. The old girl, and it was just, it was horrific. It's terrible. Was there other kids around your age living with you? I had a brother and two sisters. Were, were they um, abused as well? No, no. I, I, I found out later on in life that um, I was the one that he liked the most, and I was elected to go to him by my mum. She, she made sure that I was the only one to be abused. Um, she tried to apologize once, saying, Look, I knew you were being abused. Uh, I had nowhere to live. I had no money. What else was I to do? What the fuck do you mean? What else were you to do? I was your child. <laughs> what? So <laughs> you know? she was calling you a liar and saying, to exactly, say yeah. this shit. And then she's basically pimping yeah. you out to her dad so that she had a place exactly. to stay. You got it. Yeah. Fucking. And then my auntie came forward telling me the same story. She, she knew. And she said, oh, I was abused by him as well. And, and I'd say, well, if you were abused by him, why did you leave your own children with him to babysit? And she'd go, oh, I forgot. No, I, no, it was just sometimes I, your nana was always with him. No, she fucking wasn't because I knew I started to remember things and recall that my auntie and her dad, which is my mum's dad, they used to get on and he used to babysit the kids and I'd be horrified for, them, for my cousins. Mm-hmm. But they're all girls. Mm. My grandfather liked to abuse boys, not, not girls. God yeah, damn. so yeah, it's a, it's a fucked up bringing, mate. I tell you, <laughs> my dreams would ha- haunt your nightmares. Seriously, <laughs> oh my God, I can only imagine. Uh, and then, but I'm still here. Yeah, well, yeah, and and you're open and vulnerable about your story, which is fucking amazing. I mean, other people would just take that to the grave, or they would spiral down. You know, you've spiraled up. Yeah. I, I, that was a problem for the school. Uh, when I was going through the legals with the school, they said, and the church, they said, you know what? You're too successful to be compensated. <laughs> I'm like, what? Fuck. And they said, well, you know, it hasn't affected you. 
Well, fucking did for the first 30 years, pal. Yeah. Okay. Just because I'm successful now doesn't mean anything. You know, I, I went through all that shit. I went to jail. I, I lived on the streets. I lost a family. I lost religion. I lost all that because of you fucks. And now you're saying because I'm too successful, I shouldn't be compensated. Fuck your compensation. Give me an open apology. Let me know that you, you did what you did and you're sorry for it. And, you know, let's move on. No, no, no. An apology is worth more than money. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. Fuck. Do you mind telling the story about your grandpa on the, when you're out fishing? Oh, that was shocking. <laughs> yeah. My grandfather took me shopping, uh, fishing. Um, it was a really hot day. Um, and he had a half cabin boat and a fiberglass, you know, and we'd go fishing and he'd, he'd tell me to strip off, you know, and we, it, he'd be naked as well. And we'd, we'd be driving this boat and I, I was quite young. And, uh, we go fishing and uh, I never knew how to fish. Uh, he taught me how to fish or, or pretended to teach me how to fish. And, and I actually caught a fish and I brought it up on the boat and you know, put it in a bucket. And, and I really felt for this fish because it was so hot and the fish was in the sun. In the, you know, and I tried to move it in the shade and grandfather drag it back onto the, into the sun. And, uh, and I could see the fish floating upside down and then trying to get back upright. And it was, it was fighting for its life. And I, I was I was emotional about it, and uh, my grandfather was trying to molest me at the same time, and I'd cry or I'd, I'd wet myself. And my grandfather hated it when I urinated, so I learned to urinate. Mm. I'd hold it until a certain time, and when I urinated, he hated that. So I knew I wasn't going to be abused if I urinated, mm. and it was something I did. And um, he actually grabbed the fish and held it in front of me and stuck a knife in it. And said, "This is what will happen to you if you ever tell anybody what you know I've done to you." You know, and he slit the fish down, pulled its guts out, and uh, basically threw the fish. And I, I was traumatized by that. And then he, um, and I was crying and blubbering, and I was upset. And he said, "Go up the bow of the boat and sit down." And I went up the bow of the boat, and you couldn't sit down. The, the fiberglass was nearly melting; it was that hot. And he said, "Sit down." And I, I'd put my hands down and sit on my hands, and he'd go get your hands up in the air and hold them up in the air and sit down. And I did, and my, my bum got stuck to the bloody fibroglass. Fuck. And it, yeah, the blistering and bleeding, and it, it was horrific, horrific. And, uh, you know, he, he'd, um, he took me home, and I went for a shower, and I was, uh, you know, blistering and, and blood and that, and I'd try to tell mum, and he'd say, oh, what an idiot he was going out the front of the boat and sitting on that stupid boy, you know, and, and mum would go, yeah, Yo, you're an idiot, and slap me behind the head and get in the shower and clean yourself off. And, and I couldn't even wear underwear or pants because oh. you know, I, all the scabs used to stick to me. And, uh, yeah, and that, that, that tormented me so bad that to this day I can't fish. Hmm. Not that I don't eat fish or any animal. I just can't fish. I can't kill an animal. I just can't do it. You know, I know they get killed every day and everything, and, and I eat them, but I just can't do it myself personally. You know, and uh, I, I like to look at people who are out fishing and having a great time. And, and I know my grandkids would like to. I even tried to take my kids once and I couldn't do it. I just could not do it. I said, let's go skiing instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's go skiing. <laughs> Jesus you know? Christ. So I just can't fish, you know. God, I'm so sorry, man. That's fucking horrible. It is. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's horrific. I mean, it's just, it's a memory that, and these are memories that stay with you for life. Yeah, you try to get rid of them or move them on. And you, you think you have because i got to say from when, you know, we, my, my wife and I, had, we had a first child at 18. And so from 18 to, say, you know, 30 or whatever, 35, you're always looking after your family. So you don't think of yourself and you don't really look at your own personal health or, or your mental health. And it wasn't until we became empty nesters. And I was sitting opposite my wife at a dinner table. And I'm going, so now what? And she goes, I don't know. And I said, so you're Lara and I'm Bill. And she goes, yeah. I said, so we're no longer mum and dad? Like, because that's what we called each other for years. Mm. Hey, mum, what are you doing today? Oh, nothing, dad. What are you up to? You know, mm -hmm. and that was our thing. And now it's like, well, who are you? I don't know. Who are you? What do you want to do? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm thinking, and my wife would say, I'm, I'm thinking of going back into horse riding. What I did as a, a child, I'd like to try that again and do that. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to do some stuff. Um, I don't know. And then it hit me. 
all these emotions of my childhood just hit me like a ton of bricks and I fell into a heap. And I went, oh, my God, fuck. I guess I'll heal. That's what I'll do. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought I, I thought I had healed, but right. I wasn't even close. Yeah. It wasn't even close. So it all hit me in one, one hit and it became a um, – my wife said to me, you might want to go get help. And I said, I haven't had help in 30 years, 35 years. I said, and the last person I went to help for abused me. Fuck them. I'll help myself. <laughs> so you've never had professional, that's what I've done. you haven't gone to a counselor or a therapist or a doctor or nothing? Only forced. Uh, the, I, I had to go to two therapists, one on the, my side for the lawyers and one on their side for the lawyers. And both therapists uh, have said that I'm, uh, yeah, you got the usual PTSD and, uh, and all the all the bullshit. I mean, there's so many alphabets after my name through the psychiatrist. They <laughs> just said, fuck, mate. You know, the, the psychiatrist on the, on the school side, he said, He'd never interviewed a more scary person that wasn't and didn't possess empathy or sympathy in his life, which I possess both. Mm. He said, but he said, I've interviewed people that are in jail for, for life, never to be released. And what you possess is 10 times worse than what they possess, yet you can manage it. And, you, and I do manage it. I do because, you know, like I say to people, I met my wife when I was 15. Um, and I love her to death. And if I'm prepared to die for her, and I'm prepared to live for her, so that's what I do. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Like that you've all this turmoil through your life, but yet you—that's your one consistent, your one solid rock—is your is your wife and kids. Yeah, and they're through it all. Yeah, I mean, she was there. Yeah, I, I met her when she was 15, and we've been together since the day we met, and, and the very day we met. She told her best friend she was going to marry me. Hmm. I laughed. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> the laugh's on me. 38 <laughs> years later, I'm still, I'm still with her and, and we're still happily married and we, and we go about our lives. And, and she's obviously, she's got her horses now. She does all that. I got, um, I got my cars and my bike. And I've also got the horses for therapy, but I've got something more now. I've got me. I found myself. Mm -hmm. And that was a real opener for me to find out who I really was and what I wanted to do and be and yeah was writing your book therapeutic in a way oh absolutely yeah that was yeah that was that was great it was not only therapeutic but I have a uh, a backstory where I didn't want anybody and I mean anybody because I, I, my whole family's dead to me on the other side I don't want to know them don't want to talk to them want nothing to do with them but I didn't want any of those scumbag dogs coming back and telling stories about my life. I wanted to tell it. So I put everything in the book. And I made sure I put everything in the book for that reason, that they can't come back and say, oh, you know what, he was abused here and did this and this has happened to him. Well, fuck you. I'll, I'll put that out there. So, you, so there's no secrets. So you wrote the book for revenge. <laughs> beat him to the punch Half of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i beat him to the punch that's damn right i did yeah but it was it was good for my mental health for sure yeah putting pen to paper anytime is great for for anybody's mental health it is. I, I suggest everyone do it and then if you don't want it seen or anything burn it doesn't matter just just do it it's therapy it's great yeah that's what we did in well i, I was in an addiction treatment center and that was one of our exercises was rain down all our was it our, our guilt yeah. and our resentments and then burn it and say, right. fuck it, it's gone now, it's out of you. Move on, fuck it. That's it. That's right. Yeah. I know. It. And that's another thing. People say, oh, you forgive and forget and all that. I don't forgive. I don't forget. I will never do either. All right? Fuck them. All right? Fuck them. What I do do is I forgive myself. That's the one thing I will do. It wasn't my fault. I did nothing except to be in the wrong place, wrong time, and I was a child for fuck's sake. Okay. Anything after that, yes, I did, you know, breaking into homes and, and stealing and crime and, and going to jail. They were on me. Okay, that was my fault. But I was forced into that predicament and forced to that position. It wasn't like I wanted to go. No one fucking wants to go to jail. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's funny because, uh, like, in AA and other things, they, they talk about forgiveness and, and moving past mm. and stuff. And it's it, – uh, I mean – it's weird. It's it's like sometimes I forgive people, and other times it's like, why should I? Why the fuck should I? Why, yeah, exactly. why is that healthy? Why, why is forgiving healthy? Right. And I get it. It's like, 
I think it's if you learn to forgive, then you learn to be forgiven. I think or something. I don't fucking know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I don't get into it. I just don't forgive. I don't forget, and I'm karma, and I'm coming after you. If you fuck with me or my children or my children's children, I'm coming after you. Don't care who you are, what you do, but don't. Um, yeah, I, I just don't forgive and forget. I can't. I, I'll never forget because I'm fucking. I'm scarred with it. Yeah. And to forgive them, no, I will forgive myself. I won't forgive them though. No. Hmm. no fucking way. Fuck the more kids your kids have, it's the more people you have to protect, and the more people you have to. <laughs> you're gonna be beaten up half. Oh, uh, you know, you're gonna be eight years old beating up half Australia. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll... <laughs> Hopefully half of Australia don't think that way, but uh, <laughs> you know what? We all try to uh, protect our own, don't we, yeah. you know, as much as we can. I used to fantasize um, about it. Is yeah. that weird? It's like, I'd be like, <laughs> nah, not really. sitting there and be like, oh, I'd love to see someone try to kidnap my kid. I'd and then, like fantasize kicking the shit out of someone. <laughs> I was like, why am I doing well, that? Well, i tell you what, after the people I met in jail that actually did kidnap and torture and kill people. Jesus. You'd know, be horrified to to see these people and think that they'd be in the in the vicinity of your children, you know. And and some of them are fucking so normal and so nice, you'd think, what the fuck did you do? Oh, I just butchered a couple of kids, and you know, what the fuck? Like you're just such a decent person. You sound so decent, but you never know. See, yeah. you never know. That's why I don't carry people's baggage. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So your your book, well, not your book, but actually your the job you do, the coffin confessing, that's actually yep. turning into a movie or a TV show. Yeah, both. Both. Oh, okay. <laughs> Re- reality show, movie, and the documentary and a um, drama series. Yeah, all different different players coming forward, and yeah, it's been it's a good ride at the moment. I've just been told that uh, Marlon Wayans wants to play the coffin confessor. You know, yeah, look, I'm looking forward to whoever does what, you know. It's a ride. I'm enjoying it. Um, my wife and I came from nothing. We lived in a tent with kids. We had nothing. What we have today is everything that we've made ourselves, which is properties, cars, horses, houses, whatever we got, we, we made it ourselves. So whatever comes now is just a bonus, and it's a lot of fun, and I'm enjoying it, you know. Um Marlon is an exciting character to, to talk with. Um, he's very funny. Um, he was in White Chicks with his brother. He's, he's just a funny man. I think he'll make it a really funny project. I've been watching him since um, I was a kid on uh, In Living Color, his sketch comedy yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah shit. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, he's cool. And, uh, yeah, so there's a drama series as well, which uh, they're talking about, and documentary and the book. It, it just, yeah, it's a wild ride. I'm looking forward to seeing where it all goes. Well, that's, I'm enjoying it. That's, I mean, that's, it's incredible. Like I said, your story's just fucking fascinating. When I first walked into prison, right, I was just turned 17 years of age, right? And I was put in prison because I had nowhere to live, no food, no house, no clothing, right? Mm. I did commit a crime, mm-hmm. uh, demanding property with menaces, but it wasn't a convictable crime, but I ended up going to jail as a kid. When I walked into jail, there was a sign on this yard and it said, owed to a owed to a white man hmm. and because he, there was a lot of Aboriginals in this jail hmm. and it said, owed to a white man. It said, um, when I'm, and this is what it said. It said, white man, when you cold, you blue, when you hot, you red, when you scared, you yellow me white man. When I hot, I black. When I cold, I black. When I scared, I still black. And you have the nerve to call me colored. That's good. And that hit me big time. That was the biggest sign in my face that there is, uh, we're the most racist fuckers around. We really are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. That, that really hit me. Oh, man. Uh, and it hit me in a way that I thought, never in my life will I ever do that and, and be like that. You know, and I never was, but it was just something that stuck with me. And, and, and it's funny what sticks with you through life. Everybody's out. You know what? People would rather see you fail than succeed. That's what they do. That's why I just succeed in my own little world. Right, right. Well, you know, since I got sober too, my bubble shrunk. It's like, I, I, I don't give a fuck about anyone else either. Like just. Good on you. I got my kids, my, like my, this is, I think the fourth time I've said this in a podcast episode in a row, <laughs> but once I got sober, it was like my friends and my family went from quantity to quality 
and it's just yep. it shrunk down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. No, good on you. Yeah, well, thanks. And that and that's how it should be for you, you know, because and I, I know and I know this for a fact. Life is too short, right? We can buy a clock, we can buy a watch, we can buy a fucking time on our fucking phone, but the one thing we can't buy is time. Mm. We can't buy time. Mm-hmm. No matter how rich you are, how powerful you are, you can't buy it. And some of the richest men have tried to buy it, and they can't. They still die. We're all going to die. Enjoy your life, live it, and fucking do what you want to do. Not what anybody else wants you to do. Do what you want to do. Amen. You know, It's easier said than done, but you got to do it. Why is that? Why is it so hard? Because we always put roadblocks in our way. We say, oh, we can't do that. We got the kids or we, we can't do this because, you know, we could die. Oh, we can't do this. Mm. It's scary. Or well, you know what's on the other side of fear? Fucking fun. <laughs> go and do it. Give it a go. Stop worrying about what may happen, you know. Yeah. Huh. Just do it. Just give it a go. Well, the one yeah. thing I'm scared of, and you, I was already scared, but you made me more scared of it, is uh, becoming an empty nester. My my oldest son just graduated high school, and in two years, my other kid is graduating. It's like, well, you know, I, I've been yeah. to treatment, so I've I've already kind of healed. I'm healing. Yeah, you sort of healed, yeah. But what but, you got to do, and and this is something I say to people, is you got to prepare for the empty nesting. Don't let it just hit you like it did me. You got to prepare. And people are like, what do you mean? Well, prepare. Have you got a hobby? Get a fucking hobby a year out before you become an empty nester. And if you don't like that hobby, get another one. Do something. You need something to keep you going, active, whether it's walking, hiking, riding, fucking mountain bike climbing, skydiving, whatever the fuck it is, get a hobby because you'll need that hobby, right? And it's not for you, for you, for your wife or your family. It's for you only, and you need that hobby. And whether it's talking to other people or helping people, whatever it is, you need to do it because it's all about you. Uh, I like talking to weird Aussies. That's my hobby. Well, I don't know any, but there's some, <laughs> I guess there's some down here somewhere. <laughs> I can look some up for you. <laughs> I spoke to two in the last few weeks here between uh, you and, uh, yeah. hey, cunts. Night, night, cunts. Hey, cunts. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Yeah, well, he's a weird Aussie, but I mean, look, you know, like I say, each to their own. Absolutely. Their he's own living life. his best life and I can't be more proud of him. Hey, that's it. That's what you got to do. You know, just live your best life. And, and and what a privilege for us to be able to tell our stories. How cool is that? People like you come along and go, I want to hear your story. Are you sure? It's only a story. And they're like, fucking <laughs> oh, I don't want to tell people. Okay, cool. I'm wrapped. Well, I've told my story quite a bit. I've been on other people's podcasts and stuff. And I'm a mental health advocate. And like, I could talk for an hour about my own shit, but I got tired of, of it. I was like, fuck, I'm t- I want to hear other people's stories. I'm tired of telling my own. So <laughs> maybe you'll get your own podcast eventually. You'll be like, fuck, I'm tired of telling my story. I want to. I want to hear others. No, you know, no, I, I think what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll just let myself tell the story without telling it. If you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I'll let other people tell it for right, right. <laughs> so, so what's I like that. What's the name of your book and where can people find it? The Coffin Confessor. And it's just everywhere? It's everywhere. Yeah, you can buy it anyway. Yeah. How long ago? The Coffin Confessor by Bill Edgar. How long ago did you write that? Is there two different... Co- um, covers yeah it's two different covers okay yeah okay. so the, the it's getting second release tomorrow the 16th here in australia and the reason being is when a book comes out in australia it comes out in a in a quite a large format called a format a and if it does well it goes to paperback which means it goes global and mine did well so it went to paperback but what they decided is let's change the cover so that way we illustrate more about the backstory and where you came from, Bill, and, and not just the Coffin Confessor. So, because the book interweaves between my life growing up and the Coffin Confessor. So, they're now emphasizing more on the backstory, uh, which is really cool. So, it's, it's, yeah, I get two bites of the cherry. How cool is that? Thank you so, so much, Bill. Uh, I very, very much appreciate talking to you and you speaking with me. And I appreciate you listening to Bill speaking to me and me speaking to Bill. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, so that, that was that episode. Don't forget to make your beds and take your meds. Bye.